Okay. Um, right. So good to see you all. Um, I, can I apologise first for how my title comes across? I put handsome in there, and that was just me being facetious about designation. I wasn't sure what that meant, um, whether I was supposed to put role or he, him. So um, if you can hear me okay, I'm going to make a start. I've got about a 15-minute presentation, and Paul and I are together a few, a few times during the day um, to take questions, and we'll take some in the chat as well. So... Um, here's an image try, just trying to get your attention. This goes back to some work that um, myself and Scott Park and Paul Clark and others who are on the call did back in the day, uh, a number of years. I think I had hair. Um, and we, we moved on from a Burberry condom to one that had uh, images of genital warts on it as well when we were involved in social marketing campaigns trying to reduce teenage pregnancy in North London. Um, we did um, work at football grounds where we gave out magazines, encouraging people in a kind of, you know, with a little bit of humour to take better care of themselves. Uh, I think Paul and I were involved in a survey where people believed that chips was part of their fibre day um, because it was technically a vegetable. Um, and we were, we were at a point where we were just trying to do exactly the, the jargon that is still here around reducing inequalities and unwarranted variation and the background which you would go, well, obviously that's true. And I think it's something that we've grown to accept, which is part of the problem. Um, and that secondly, that tends to lead to differences in sometimes procedures and treatments that people have. And there's been research in the States that I've been looking at uh, that's been presented quite widely that shows that the NHS unwittingly is racist um, in terms of um, handing out job roles to people based on ethnicity, um, cases of bullying and harassment, but right through to the bit that I'm interested in, which is about are there variations in your experience and your outcome according to, you could say four characteristics, your age, your sex, your level of deprivation and your, and your ethnicity. And those four can be joined together in a whole range of very clever um, clustering solutions to, to say that people live in the chattering classes or the graffitied ghettos and so on. So that yeah, that's one example um you will pro i'm sure some of you have probably heard the example of i'm going to keep sharing some of you have probably heard this one where you know in london as you go east your uh, chances of living longer literally go down sort of a year a station this is something I've researched again recently. Um, we found a while ago that there was a statistically significant difference between your chances of having your breast repaired or your breast removed, depending on the socioeconomic background from which you are from. Um, I've kind of looked recently and updated that. There's, uh, obviously, all this will get shared and there's some references here for people. So, so interestingly, um, by ethnicity, there's a paper, a proper paper that's been published in a proper journal. Uh, which shows that ethnicity doesn't seem to be a factor, but the work we did originally did show that social class was a factor, and we want to try and address some of that. Um, there's a similar example, sorry, some of these are a bit gruesome, similar example for men. Um, you can imagine if I offered you two options to have your bowel reconstructed and to have a colostomy bag, which one you preferred, there is a statistically significant difference depending on your class on which you're likely to have. Um, and just to kind of bring it even closer to home for some of us, um, these are the sorts of things you find when you move to a pointy bit of the country surrounded by the sea, um, that you get very significant differences depending on local diets. I'll let, I'll let you wince and cross your legs uh, for those of you who live south of London. Okay, um, just sort of bringing it up to date a little bit then, because uh, those slides, as you can probably tell from them, I haven't looked at for years and I kind of, I went off last week to see if I could find them um, and they still seem to exist. And some early analysis that we're doing seems to show that those patterns are still there. Um, if you come through to this week uh, with COVID, um, you can see that the wait, waiting lists get reported as having grown dramatically and everyone kind of understands why that might happen. What we tend to do very little of or in, in not enough detail for me is analyze how that affects different types of people. 
So in the case of waiting lists, for example, they've doubled um, in poorer areas. They've only gone up by about a third in more affluent areas. So even if you start to think about trying to adjust for late presentation, which is the usual kind of get out of jail card, that more middle class people tend to be less embarrassed about symptoms, tend to have researched them better. The fact that waiting list have jumped during COVID is, is worrying, I think. Um, in Kent, we have a big traveller population. Um, travellers tend to have worse outcomes, tend not to be registered with GPs reliably, um, tend to use emergency departments in a different way to other people, and um, probably have had lower vaccine uptake as well. So there's a lot of outreach trying to resolve some of that at the moment, but it's just another example of the changes that we've kind of got at the moment. One of the big successes of open data social lives, which Paul and I will talk about a little in a little bit more detail, and it you know it absolutely is an inequality and an awful variation, is the risk of domestic abuse. Um, and that became a big issue during lockdown, uh, you know, a kind of a front page of the Sunday newspapers story. And we've and this this story I think goes right to the heart of what open data saves lives about is to kind of make quite bold decisions about information governance and about linking data from the police to the NHS for purely altruistic purposes. Unfortunately, a lot of the noise about, you know, GPs sharing their data under GDPR um, gets swept into quite general arguments about what's the role of the private sector and so on, forgetting for a moment that GPs are private businesses effectively. Um, if you do it carefully and safely and you're doing good things and you can sleep well at night and you would stand up in court to defend yourself, there's a lot of good, we would say, from linking data together. And looking at domestic abuse is a particularly sensitive example because you're trying to identify families at risk. And you can see Theresa May, um, that is Libra patch on her arm that monitors, uh, she's a diabetic, that monitors her blood sugar. Um, we are increasingly close to a Bluetooth relationship between Libra patch, some sort of small radio and, a, and an insulin pump where you could actually monitor, you could, you could keep your blood sugar at a much flatter level instead of hypoing up and down. Um, our initial hypothesis, we, we haven't explored this yet, but from talking to a guy who's a, a renal physician and a professor at Kent, we think there'll be lots of uh, procedures and treatments that seem to break down on class lines, which in an NHS, which is free at the point of care, in theory shouldn't be there. But um, I'm really interested in how class and ethnicity and deprivation things come into play around people's use of the NHS. And we're not looking at it in much detail yet. Uh, I think you'll find from here, yeah, um, I think what's, if, if those kind of old slides are kind of Tony Blair or how it was and the problem's still there, what's quite good now is things that didn't used to exist. So like the use of open data, the use of, a, you know, convening of open innovation at pace uh, through open data, Institute in Leeds, as it was here, um, one of the CSUs has done some really good work sharing their code around inequalities, looking at variations in referrals, all there, all to be downloaded. Here are the R scripts. If you can get your data organized in the right way, you can run the same analysis. So this didn't this didn't used to exist 10 years ago in this way. I think it's really positive that it's there. Um, that point about um, inequalities again. So we a lot of the stuff that you've seen reported during COVID, um, you'll have you'll have come up, you'd have like like we all learned a new expression, COVID or COVID nineteen. We you a, a newish one for a lot of people was BAME and non BAME, um, and people, um, you know, as on the left here, I was listening to her on Radio Four last night. She's got a show starting. She came here from Kenya, and suddenly was grouped with Filipinos. In it was the example she gave. You know, here's the whites and here's the rest of you kind of thing. Um, that doesn't make a lot of sense epidemiologically. It doesn't make any sense in terms of social marketing and in terms of how you com um, communicate with people about vaccine take up. Um, it doesn't link to any behavioral or attitudinal patterns which work along white, non white. Um, you need to look at this stuff in a lot more detail. So, one of the Open Data Saves live sessions that we ran, and there's a screen grab there on the right. Um, with Professor Richard Weber uh, was about using people's names. So using your first name and your second name to allocate your ethnicity 
um, at, at a level of accuracy beyond what we would have thought would be possible. And that's allowed us in the NHS to say diabetes is off the scale for Sikhs. And that links back to what we did back in the social marketing with Scott and Paul, where there was a cultural thing about being perceived to be physically big, have a big house, a big car, offer uh, rich food to guests and so on. Um, and we saw diabetes growing in that population hugely. And that, that hasn't gone away to some extent. There'll be little small pockets of success, but at an overall level, those types of patterns are still really important and not, and not analysed as much as they should be. And that's something we want to pick up in Open Data Saves Lives. Um, I've put this in as a reference just so you've got it, which is the new um, Data Saves Lives report, which talks to all of this. And I hope starts to lay the ground for more sharing, uh, better information governance. That's one of the big things that we're kind of pushing through Open Data Saves Lives. And with a minute to go, I'm just going to keep us on time there. So I've just put this in as a kind of placeholder, really, of something that we might come back to. So part of this afternoon's point is for you all to say, these are areas that we would like to concentrate on and do some more research on. This is the one I'm interested in. If you're interested in class and ethnicity and any sort of variation, this is what I'm going to be doing for the next five or 10 years. So just join in. Um, let's encourage public health to drop the index of multiple deprivation and start to use geodemographics more. Um, we've got some amazing mapping work coming later from a guy called Ed from Integrated Digital, where you can start to plot the fact that some housing estates have been built in such a way that people are completely reliant on cars, and therefore you then get obesity, and you then get heart disease, and you then get diabetes, and so on. And we've got planning decisions which just don't seem to take account of people's lifestyle. So um, it's thanks very much, Mark. I'm going to uh, give you a, uh, a round of applause here, so a bit of, a, bit of clapping.